Welcome to Newsfeed. I'm Tom Mustin. Today we're talking about boosting immunity and foods that could provide the opposite effect. Plus, the new optimism that movie theaters will make a comeback as more start to reopen. But first, Pfizer and its German partner plan to deliver even more COVID vaccines than originally thought. That's partly because a new plant opened in Germany to expand manufacturing. They also got approval to withdraw six doses from each vial instead of five. Together, they planned on making about two billion doses. Now they're expecting to fill orders for at least another half a billion just this year. Meanwhile, the Internet is lighting up with advertisements for COVID vaccines for sale. It's not clear if they're real, but names like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are being put out there for between $500 and $1,000 a dose. The Checkpoint Cybersecurity Company found these vaccines for sale and shared them with us. There are also advertisements selling fake negative COVID-19 test results and vaccine passports. As of last week, AMC announced that 99% of its theaters were open. Regal Cinemas will start opening this Friday. It's been tough for an industry dependent on packing large crowds into enclosed spaces. But as Usher Qureshi reports, smaller theater owners are optimistic the show will go on. In the past few weeks, theaters have been allowed to reopen in big markets like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago for the first time since the start of the pandemic. It's probably the toughest year we've ever had. I mean, uh, the Pickwick has been open for almost 100 years. Dino Vlahakis owns the iconic Art Deco Pickwick Theater in downtown Park Ridge, Illinois. The classic movie house has been a mainstay here for generations, but closed on March 16th of last year. Movie theaters have had absolutely no income. The movie theater was a, is, is worldwide a $48 billion business. And after March 16th, it went down to zero. It has been a tough year. U.S. box office revenues dropped by 80% in 2020 to $2.3 billion, compared to $11.4 billion in 2019. Without any showtimes, the Pickwick turned to innovative ways to stay afloat. They sold popcorn, candy, and other movie night snacks for curbside pickup, minus the movie. So we'll go home, settle down, and watch a movie. Here you go. During the summer, the popcorn pickup was wonderful. We had good turnout. We did it once a week, and then we opened it to a second day. Uh, but we continued pretty much for every Saturday. Thank you so much. They also rented out their marquee for personalized messages. Happy birthday wishes, graduation wishes, save the date wishes. And that's actually been actually something that we never thought would be we would be doing it. And that turned out to be one of the biggest benefits. But once again, the popcorn is popping. Theaters like the Pickwick, which has 900 seats in its main auditorium, are allowed to operate at up to 25% capacity. When people are in the big theater, they do have a sign of relief because they feel much more comfortable in the big theater because there's nobody near them. <laughs> While the financial scars of the pandemic will linger for some time, Vlahakis says he has faith in the magic of cinema to help them rebound. I really believe when the movies start to hit, and that's going to be about June, July, when you're going to see a brand new big picture coming out, I think then we'll, we'll get back. We're social people, and we love the movies. Reporting from Park Ridge, Illinois, I'm Usher Qureshi. Well, last week we saw new claims for jobless benefits fall to their lowest level since the start of the pandemic, but it's still really tough to get a job right now. A majority of people looking for jobs say it's actually become more competitive because of the pandemic, according to LinkedIn. The competitive market and an overwhelming number of applicants, hiring managers are saying that video has become the most important thing for vetting candidates and more important, especially when it comes to soft skills. Those soft skills include things like problem solving, teamwork, and communication. Today, LinkedIn is rolling out a new feature to help you showcase those skills to hiring managers. It's called Cover Story. You'll find an option to add it on your profile page. It's a 20-second video feature that serves as a personalized introduction to a potential employer. When it comes to recording your video message, it really is all about your personality. If you're a veterinarian, have, a, have your dog in there with you or a pet. Um, if you're not, it's probably not the right way to go, but you really want to make it an opportunity to showcase your soft skills. You'll also be able to add your gender pronouns to your LinkedIn profile now if you'd like future employers to know those before you apply. Meanwhile, LinkedIn's Workforce Confidence Index shows people have been sticking with their jobs during the pandemic, even if they wanted to switch. They just wanted to make sure they collect a steady paycheck. 
But as we're starting to see things improve now, the LinkedIn career expert we talked with expects more people will be looking for new positions. Some industries now have hiring rates actually above pre-COVID levels. Those include fields like software and IT and transportation logistics. Next on Newsfeed, some fun. Arcade games like pinball became a healthy distraction during the pandemic. You won't believe the sales and how for some it's turned into a competitive sport. Pandemic started a new trend of bringing arcade games like pinball home. Dan Grossman takes a look at the sport that has turned into some people's basements into a relic of the past. The ambient sounds of nature are a clear indicator that spring has sprung. Just endorphin rush, just constant. If there was ever a name to fit a personality, that was the direct you've got little beeps and bloops and dings. They all kind of have the same similar like ding, 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 ding. Tim McCool's is it. Oh, look at that, I got chills just thinking about it. At 32, he has this passionate love. My mom, she uh, is the one that really got me into it. Yeah, mostly I'm watching him because he's way better than I am. That only a mother could give. It is a great, wonderful, fun thing. And it was nice having machines at home during the pandemic. During the pandemic, pinball has exploded in popularity. Stern, the world's largest pinball manufacturer based in Chicago, reported sales during quarantine five times as high as ever before, with record backlogs to make more machines. Another U.S. company, Jersey Jack, reported selling out of its newest machine in two hours back in October. The at-home buying has helped offset any dip in popularity as these were the places that have allowed the sport to thrive. It's really gone up another level. Dan O'Connor is part of a pinball league in North Carolina and today is its first day back together. We had a at-home tournament even and I actually got third place in that. Previously, he was getting beaten by 14-year-olds the likes of Eve Caudill who picked up the sport after her dad bought a machine for their basement. I was pretty proud of that. I don't want your high score to look ridiculous. Tim's been here long before the COVID spike. A lot of people who probably didn't think about considering buying a machine beforehand, they were like, I need pinball. It's not hard to see why it saw a boost in a time where most things were flipped on their heads. I'm Dan Grossman, Child reporting. Ahead, a crisis still unfolding in Texas related to extreme winter weather, but you can't tell just by driving through a neighborhood. Plus this. The death of George Floyd over the summer impacted so many, but has the passion for social justice faded in some communities? We'll take you to a town where they say they are having conversations they did not have before, and we will take a look at the impact those conversations are having. It's called an invisible disaster, perhaps the largest plumbing crisis of modern times. Many homes in Texas have had water restored or turned on by municipalities since historic winter weather earlier this year. But hot water or even flushing toilets still is not possible for those that need labor intensive and costly repairs to their pipes. The people who are most vulnerable, which is the elderly, the uninsured, underinsured, disabled, they don't have personal connections to plumbers, so they're 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 waiting. They're being the, the last served, and that's who we've really targeted in our responses. Water Mission is a Christian engineering nonprofit. Their crews have been on the ground in areas like Austin, repairing pipes and sometimes replacing the entire home's plumbing. Through partners like Plumbers Without Borders and American Standard Brand, they put out calls for help. Licensed plumbers from all across the country showed up. There's a story, there's a woman named Lynn, she's a single mother with three kids, and they came in and they just decided to repipe her whole house, and she couldn't afford any of it. All these repairs are absolutely free, and they unclogged her drains, they went far enough to even install new fixtures, and then they gave her money, their own money, to buy a new bed, because her bed was damaged. And you're, you're dealing with an area of the country that doesn't really deal with frozen pipes for the most part because of the unusual weather. So you even got folks not that accustomed to having to rip into walls, but you're talking about opening up walls. You're talking about pinpointing, you know, leak problems. Um, and obviously uh, you're talking about days of efforts uh, on a, a given house. 
Water Mission's efforts in Texas are entering a new phase now. They no longer need volunteer plumbers, but they are working with local plumbers to provide money and supplies to continue repairs for the most vulnerable. You can find out more about their efforts at watermission.org. Many Americans started having difficult conversations after the death of George Floyd. As Chris Stewart shows us, communities can be successful when they come together. Communities like Edina, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis. Step into Nicole Jennings' book club today. Here to know, I don't think this is true. You'll hear conversations she wasn't having with her neighbors a year ago. When you know more, you can do more. This book club was born in the months after the death of George Floyd. The discussion is often about issues at the core of what took place less than 10 miles from where they live in the Minneapolis suburb of Edina. The fact that I'm a person of color. So for me to talk about life is not difficult, but for someone else to talk about my life and my experiences and to understand them from my point of view, it takes a lot. Literally, the world was watching. It takes someone who would want to listen and want to learn and not feel as though uh, I'm po anyone's pointing fingers, but my reality is my reality. For eight years, she's lived in this neighborhood that is mostly white. Unless you get out of your bubble, out of your comfort zone, you'll never recognize what you're impacting and what's also impacting you. My favorite bumper stickers I've seen is, change is good, you go first. Like many suburbs across America, Adina is evolving. Mayor Jim Hovland says his city has taken steps over the years to become more inclusive, like hiring a race and equity coordinator. Gaining a better understanding of uh, what these issues have historically been for people that are different from us, that have faced more impediments in life, uh, things that we just took for granted. Usually in Edina, I think we try and stray away from the hard conversations about race, diversity, and inclusion in order to avoid conflict. High school senior Shreya Kunkamola has taken an active role in Edina when it comes to social justice. She's building a virtual art gallery titled From Struggling to Healing. It's something that we can all come together with and come to appreciate together. And I think from that, then we have the ability to understand other people and where they're coming from. And you've inherited it. It's hard to know what progress looks like for an issue so deep. People paying attention to what it is that goes on over here. So personal. There's no yardstick for progress when you think about the centuries of um, acts that have not been discussed. Nicole says book club conversations have grown over the months to be authentic. We can take what we're reading and look around us in the world. It's the fact that we listen and when by doing so we learn from each other. As we close in on a year since many parts of America started having uncomfortable conversations, Nicole says it's important the discussions don't go quiet. Ahmaud Arbery, right? That was before. And then right after that was Breonna Taylor and it was like sequential. And again, you don't recognize it until it got in your backyard. That was frustrating. That, that was frustrating. It was that concept. It wasn't the fact that let's talk about it moment. No, I'm, I'm eager to do that, actually. So um, I welcome it. In Edina, Minnesota, I'm Chris Stewart reporting. Some snack foods may be hurting your immune system. And during a pandemic, it's probably not something you want to hear. New research from the Environmental Working Group focuses on a preservative in processed foods called TBHQ. Many popular items contain it. The group says this shines a spotlight on a larger issue of how preservatives in our food are regulated. For decades, um, FDA has either let the chemical companies and the food companies decide whether these chemicals are safe to eat or they've relied on outdated science and outdated reviews that don't reflect the, the, the most recent science. 
The FDA approved TBHQ for use back in 1977, but a lot has changed since then. The study from EWG shows the preservative impacts immune cell proteins, which can lead to a number of adverse effects. That may be uh, playing a role in the rise in food allergies or uh, making people more susceptible to um, getting the flu or making the flu vaccine less, less effective. Now, more research is needed to see how much of TBHQ it takes to cause noticeable impacts. In the meantime, the EWG is calling on federal regulators to look more closely at the chemicals the companies put into our foods. So we know there are chemicals like TBHQ, BHA, BHT, potassium bromate, some of the dyes. Um, you know, we have reason to believe that there may be health risks. So let's start there. The EWG says consumers can also play a big role by reaching out to local regulators or food companies. Ultimately, it is the, the consumers and the public buying these products and they have the ultimate say. And so when people start raising their voice, um, we actually do see change quite often happen in the marketplace. For now, the EWG suggests avoiding TBHQ as much as possible. You can find products that contain the preservative at EWG.org. We go to work every single day looking to tell overlooked stories in American history. There's only a small number of the historical sites in America related to historic contributions from women or communities of color. Next on Newsfeed, we're looking at the effort to change this. History is worth telling. That's a complicated question here in the U.S. where some history is overlooked and can paint an incomplete picture. But as Maya Rodriguez tells us, there's now a concerted effort to better reflect our country's diverse history. Actor, singer, activist, Paul Robeson was a man who wore many hats. He was really a renaissance man. From the 1920s through the 1960s, his career on stage and screen and his social justice advocacy took him all over the world. Because he was the quintessential father of the civil rights movement. And eventually to his return to the family home in his later years in West Philadelphia, now the Paul Robeson House and Museum. Basically grew up with him being my old Uncle Paul. Vernoka Michael lived across the street and just retired as the museum's director. Well, this house has meant a lot to this community simply because it sends out a message. A message about history, specifically black history. A lot of our history and a lot of our story was not written down. And because of that, we're not able to trace uh, a lot of the historic sites or a lot of our ancestors. So having a house like this that can date back to the 1800s, that's, that's like a phenomenon. It's highly unusual because of the more than 100,000 sites listed in the National Trust for Historic Preservation, only 10% are related to historic contributions from women or communities of color. The number of African American historic sites is a mere Two percent. We go to work every single day looking to tell overlooked stories in American history. Brent Legs leads the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, part of the National Trust. They've set aside $25 million to preserve 150 sites related to historic black contributions. One of those is the Paul Robeson House. We have real strong economic arguments to make because preservation is good business for cities and in particular for rural communities. So preservation has significant economic value. It's a place-making strategy. It helps to, to grow creative economies. The house is starting this whole redevelopment that's really happening in West Philadelphia. And we're at the vocal point of that. And there's work to be done. We would like to finish off the apex because that was never done in this last renovation. In the hopes that added space will add to the history here. But we want to make sure that after we're gone, that there was a footprint, that there was a mark, and there was a story to be told. And not forgotten. In Philadelphia, I'm Maya Rodriguez. Thank you, Maya. And that does it for us today. I'm Tom Muston. This is Newsfeed.